I'm Dr. Alex Dunhill from the University of Leeds, um, and I've been invited to deliver a keynote presentation on the quality of the fossil record as part of the Stratigraphic Paleobiology Workshop um, as part of this Virtual Paleontology Congress. Um, so I'm approaching this keynote uh, presentation as, as an intro to sampling biases in the fossil record. So it's featuring the work of a lot of other people other than myself, and I'm aiming it more at those who perhaps aren't familiar with the, the sampling bias literature, um, as this is an issue that affects all paleontologists, not just the, the smaller group of people who actively work in this, in this area. Uh, so it's an overview without the numerical nitty-gritty that often bogs down uh, many of the papers, including my own, in this field. So I, I started with the title, um, and the title is inspired by Darwin, who features in this talk a few times. Um, so a history of the world in perfect kept is, is a quote from uh, one of Darwin's works. I'm not quite sure which one, I can't quite remember. Um, but then I'm going to talk through, uh, sort of a walkthrough, um, in a, uh, talking through identifying, quantifying and dealing with sampling bias in the fossil record. So paleontologists often give the impression that they don't believe uh, the data that the fossil record provides. Uh, and I guess this could be a good reason uh, because the fossil record is both incomplete and biased. Uh, and graphs uh, like this diversity curve through time um, are, are subject to a whole host of bios biases as outlined by this excellent schematic uh, by one of the recent powerhouses in the bias, bias literature, Andrew Smith. Um, so Andrew Smith uh, kick-started uh, the, the, re the, the renewal of the interest in, in quantifying biases in the fossil record back in the early, uh, in about 2000, 2001. And he produced this schematic as part of a review paper published in the Journal of the Geological Society in 2007, uh, basically that identifies all of the drivers, tectonics, climates, biological drivers, geological drivers, and then human sampling drivers. So it's a sort of filter flowchart. Your fossil starts at the bottom here and has to go through all of these filters before it can be counted uh, within uh, the biodiversity of the fossil record. However, recognising biases in the fossil record is not a new line of interest. So if you go back all the way to Darwin and his works on the origins of species, um, you get a whole chapter in his, in his very famous book on the origins of species about what's called the vagaries of the fossil record. Um, and it basically focuses on why Darwin was excuses, basically, as to why the fossil record doesn't show the gradualistic uh, view of evolution that Darwin was trying to promote, uh, mainly because it's incomplete, patchy and gappy. But perhaps the most important question we could ask as paleontologists isn't whether the fossil record is, is incomplete or biased, because we know, we know that it is. It's whether it is adequate, despite all of these shortcomings, for answering macroevolutionary and macroecological questions. So that's going to be sort of what I'm going to finish the talk with, looking at all of the biases that affect what we see in the fossil record and then trying to come to some conclusions as to how we can make sure that the data we have is adequate for answering the questions that we are interested in. So I'm going to break this talk down into a number of sections. First of all, I'm going to introduce uh, the concept of the vagaries of the fossil record, looking at the raw fossil record uh, and then the incompleteness and the bias that is contained within it. I'm going to be talking about identifying bias in the fossil record, how you, you as a paleontologist can identify bias in your data and how you can quantify it, how you can put a number on it, a statistic, because that's often important. If you want to prove something, you need to have numerical information backing it up. And then perhaps most importantly, how you can deal with this bias in the fossil record. How can you reduce the impact that the incompleteness and biasing factors within your data have on the outcomes of your analyses? So we'll focus mainly on three ways we can do this. One of a basic method of filling in the gaps in the data, so dealing with incompleteness. Uh, and then we'll look at two methods that are probably the most popularly used for dealing with bias in, in, in paleontological studies today. So subsampling and then sampling proxies and residual modelling. Um, there are a whole host of other methods out there, modelling methods, inference methods, uh, that I won't focus on, so by no means think that this uh, talk provides an, an exhaustive list of things you can do to deal with sampling biases in paleontological data. It does not. And then I'll go back to some reflections, looking back at those uh, issues around incompleteness, bias, and whether our data is adequate or not. I'm going to fa finish with attempting to draw up a protocol of best practice for sort of stepwise guide 
very broad and, and vague as to how you can should go about identifying, quantifying and dealing with bias in the data. So the simplest way to discuss completeness, bias and adequacy in the fossil record is through biodiversity through time. We're looking at how the diversity of life has changed, say, through the, the Phanerozoic last 550 million years or so. And by this, I mean paleodiversity, diversity, species richness, etc., which I may use interchangeably throughout this talk, but ultimately I'm referring to the same thing. And the best place to start with this topic is with Sepkowski's uh, paleodiversity curve. So Jack Sepkowski, sadly no longer with us, was one of the founding fathers of sort of big macroevolutionary patterns, looking at big macroevolutionary patterns through deep time. He compiled his compendium of generic diversity through the Phanerozoic. And this particular plot, which is probably the most famous wiggly line in paleontology, is looking at the number of marine invertebrate families through time. Um, it shows the diversification of the three faunas that he splits his, his, his uh, life into, so the Cambrian faunas, things like inarticulate brachiopods, trilobites, the Paleozoic faunas, things like crinoids and, and other brachiopods, and then uh, finally the modern faunas, so things like bivalves and echinoderms, things that are very commonly seen in the, Earth, in, in the Earth's oceans today. So this is raw data extracted directly from the fossil record. What he basically did was take the first known occurrence of a particular family or genus, and then its last occurrence, and counted it as being present in every time in between that. And it shows the major patterns that we associate with the diversification and history of life over the last 550 million years or so uh, today. So we see a rise in diversity. First of all, sorry, I've got my clicking on there. We see uh, the mass extinction event. So here are the big five labelled in blue. We have the uh, late Ordovician, the late Devonian, the late Permian, the late Triassic and the late Cretaceous extinction events which are clearly shown as drops in standing diversity. We see sort of adaptive radiation and diversification events, the Cambrian explosion and then the Great Ordovician biodiversification event in the lower Paleozoic. And then we also see the exponential rise in diversity and the rebound of, from the late Permian mass extinction all the way through the Mesozoic and into the Cenozoic and up to the present day. The present day figure isn't, isn't um, presented on this graph as it would be way off the page at 1900 uh, marine families. The problem with this is that is incomplete. So can we trust Sepkowski's uh, diversity curve given that it's derived from raw fossil data? So this diagram from a paper I published with uh, Mike Benton uh, and other colleagues. Um, so Mike's another prominent figure in the debate around sampling biases and how to deal with them in the fossil record. He was my PhD supervisor, so I've worked with Mike very closely on this. Um, and this uh, graphic, I think, really effectively shows that of all life ever existed, we only know a very small uh, proportion of it. So here we have um, three blocks within this big blocky schematic. Uh, first at the bottom here we have the known fossil record, which represents all the fossils that have been discovered and documented through time. And then beyond this we have the potential fossil record, and this is all the fossils that are preserved in the rocks, which are yet to be discovered. So this represents a theoretical maximum of, which, of, of, of the knowledge of the past life that we are likely to accrue uh, uh, through study, and, and this cannot be surpassed. One day, maybe we will approach the theoretical maximum and we'll know everything that there is to know that is preserved in the rocks. I don't think we're near that at the moment. And then beyond that is the wider unknowable reality. So all the life forms that have ever lived, but which we have not been, which have not been preserved in the fossil record and therefore will never be known to science. The challenge for paleontologists is trying to quantify this wider reality based on what we know and may yet know from the known and potential fossil records. It's a daunting task considering that based on the presence of preservable hard parts, only around 8% of living taxa are likely to preserve, could be preserved as fossils. So we can infer that at best, even the potential fossil record may represent less than 10% less than of life that has ever lived. It's not a very positive outlook. At worst, 
fossil record is not only incomplete, but it is also biased. So the levels of incompleteness through time are probably not consistent. They're dependent on a number of things. So this infographic produced by Emma Dunn from the University of Birmingham really effectively shows all of the biases that can be affecting our diversity patterns that we get from the fossil record. So we have probability of preservation and quality of preservation. So not everything's going to be fossilized and it depends on the preservable hard parts, the environment that an organism may live in, and also the quality of the preservation of the environment. We may not actually be able to identify a fossil down to a species or generic level because of the quality of preservation. If all of this stayed in a uniform uh, manner through time, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem. We've got incompleteness, but we would have consistency of incompleteness. But that's not the case because other things also affect uh, bias in the fossil record. So geological setting and rock age, younger rocks are generally better preserved, less deformed. So we have a bias through time. Where older rocks are harder to sample from and will preserve fossils of, of poorer quality. Geographical location, so the accessibility depending on where fossiliferous deposits are today. Um, accessible locations are naturally most popular. Um, fossiliferous locations in hard to reach countries, dangerous parts of the world, um, places that are generally inaccessible due to, to lack of infrastructure are harder to sample and will therefore be less well sampled than places that are right next to roads, for example. So collection efforts, um, there's variable collection efforts through time and also human bias in the, in, in the way um, organisms are studied. So some fossil organisms are apparently sexier than others. Um, use of a dinosaur on, on the icon for this category is, is obviously no, um, is no coincidence. People like to work on dinosaurs even though their fossil record is quite poor. Fewer people will work on brachiopods even though their fossil record is excellent. So there's all of these biases going on affecting how we interpret uh, through time. So how can we identify bias in paleodiversity studies. So I would start with the qualitative assessment. Plot your data. So if you have a time series of diversity through time, plot it and have a look at what that looks like. So here we have dinosaur diversity through the entire Mesozoic. And there are a number of dips in diversity. So there's one here in the lower to middle Jurassic. So this is the uh, Plains uh, Bachian through to the top of the Arlenian. And through here, we only have a small handful, like two or three or four or five uh, genera of dinosaurs. Um, this is not representative of a massive extinction of dinosaurs. There's no evidence of anything happening that's driving dinosaurs to extinction at this time. It's merely because we have very high sea levels and not much continental rock deposited, not much terrestrial, uh, many terrestrial environments preserved. And we only get a few types of dinosaurs, like this sauropod here and, and, this, and this theropod Dilophosaurus. Um, so our knowledge of this time period is poor, but it's not because of a true biological signal. It, it is a sampling bias problem. Um, another, if we plot two different types of marine invertebrates here, we've got our marine mollusks through time in black, this is the entire Phanomothoic, and then our marine annelids in red. If we look at these groups in the modern oceans, they are both quite speciose, 50,000 species of mollusk, 22,000 species of, an of annelids. So there are roughly twice as many species of mollusks, but if you look at the plot, uh, from the paleo uh, biology database through time, you see there are hardly any marine annelids at all, whereas the marine mollusks go up to around 800 uh, genera, um, in particularly in the Cretaceous and, and the Paleogene. Um, this is obviously vastly different to what we see in modern oceans if we assume this ratio stays similar throughout time. They're on the same order of magnitude, at least here. But what we're dealing with here is an obvious bias, and it's an obvious preservation bias, where most marine annelids are soft bodied whereas most marine mollusks have a hard, fossilizable shell. So it's quite easy to plot um, bias data through time, and we go back to um, the possession of hard parts as being characteristic of, of, of the fossil record in general, and soft body things unlikely to be preserved. So just by plotting your data in a qualitative assessment, you can have a, get a good idea of what's biasing your data. Um, but how can we quantify bias? So I'm a quantitative paleobiologist and I like to put statistic patterns like the ones I've just presented in the past few pages. Um, so what we're going to go is, is back to the 1970s and, and a chap called uh, David Raup. who uh, was a paleontologist uh, at the University of Chicago. Again, sadly, no, no longer with us. He passed away a couple of years ago. And he would really be a good candidate for the crown of, of the father of quantitative paleobiology. Um, and during 
his studies in the 1970s, he attempted to, he was probably the first person to attempt to quantify sampling bias in the fossil record. And what he did was he looked at the amount of geological map areas, so the amount of outcropping sedimentary rock through time in the USA and in Canada and also in the wider uh, the other parts of the world, and, and, and then correlated that with uh, diversity through time. So here we have the amount of geological map area through time. You can see it's quite low in the Paleozoic, a little bit higher in, in, in the Mesozoic, much higher into the Cretaceous and then into the more recent uh, Cenozoic. Um, we get a lot of outcropping rock. So this fits with that older rock, not as well preserved as younger rock idea that we saw in Emma Dunn's infographic. Um, and then you can look at the number of species through time. And you can obviously see that this follows a very similar pattern to the rock outcrop areas. So low through the Paleozoic, and then we get this increase, gradually increase through the Mesozoic. So what he did was he, he, he looked at the correlation between these two data sets. And he found that there was a very close correlation between geological map area and the number of species through time. And this led him to the conclusion that the biodiversity pattern that we see in the fossil record is not necessarily a true biological pattern. It's not a macroevolutionary pattern through time. And merely it's just buried beneath a big pile of rocks. And all we're seeing is a geological sampling bias, geological mega bias, overprinting um, our biological signal. So using something like a map area and then correlating it with, with, with species, um, at species. Um, this is using a sampling proxy. So map area is a sampling proxy in that it's a metric that represents the collecting habits of paleontologists and should represent some or all of the geological and human factors that can introduce error into interpretations of data. But critically, it must be independent from the signal it seeks to correct. Because if you find a correlation between two data sets that aren't independent, obviously that should start ringing some alarm bells. And this takes us back to Emma's infographic again. So we want our sampling proxy to capture all of these issues, these biasing issues in, in our fossil data to be effective, or at least the majority of this um, sampling bias. So just a couple of uh, commonly used sampling proxies. So one of them is outcrop area, so like David Raup looking at map area, outcropping sedimentary rock that may or may not be buried beneath superficial deposits, vegetation, land use, say it equates to map area, um, runs on the idea that we're dealing with sort of a species area effect, why greater amount of rock from a certain time period that is preserved and outcropping at the surface will preserve a greater diversity of life in the same way that a greater area sampled in ecology should support a greater diversity of life given the species area effects. So there's just a few some, uh, studies that have used outcrop areas, so David Raup's pioneering studies of the 1970s, uh, Patrick Wall here mapping uh, outcrop areas uh, on a global sense through time, of course, of course epoch level, but nevertheless quite a, a uh, impressive feat. Uh, and then also at the local scale, so this is a piece of work from my uh, former PhD student, Fiona Walker from the University of Bristol, um, looking at outcrop areas of the, of the Cretaceous chalk using 3D British geological survey models, and then comparing that to the diversity we get um, from this small scale data, uh, data study. So another commonly used sampling proxy um, are formation counts. So formation counts, total uh, counts of total um, fossil bearing or specific clade bearing um, geological formations through time. Um, so these are regarded as a good metric for sampling as they supposedly cover lots of those points in, in Emerton's infographics, such as environmental heterogeneity, geographic spread, rock area, and human collecting effort. Um, also, um, this is a sort of easy to acquire data source when good map area measurements aren't available. Good map area measurements aren't available for large proportions of the world, um, and, and therefore it's much easier to get hold of uh, a count of, of fossiliferous formations. Um, the majority of studies that have used sampling proxies have found close correlations between these proxies. Um, of paleodiversity and, and, and the sampling proxies have thus cemented the ideas of David Raup that the fossil record is, is subject to severe megabias. So we see here from these correlation coefficients in, in, in Paul Barrett's 2009 paper looking at uh, dinosaur diversity and, and sampling bias through time, you can see that in the Ordovician, I mean the Ornithischian and Theropod data sets, the correlations are exceptionally close. 
Uh, but interestingly, not so much in the, in the somewhat animal uh, data, not significant at all. About so how the fact that we know we're dealing with severe megabytes in a cluster data, but what can we do about it? So surely there's some method that we can employ so we can we can remove some of this bias in senior level, particularly when we're fairly confident about what is causing these, these issues. So the simplest method of dealing with incompleteness is by filling in the gaps and ranges. Um, so as we've set Kosky curves, we can count attacks as being present in every time bin uh, between its first and last occurrence. So here we have a little schematic of time, putting up this side, time bin one to seven, and then we have different species, A to E, on the top. And the red arrows indicate where they're occurring in this sequence. So species A occurs throughout, B just in the first half, C in the last latter half, D has some gaps, which we then can infer this organism must have been present within these time periods, even though it's not sampled. We can range it through and we can fill in the gaps. And sometimes when fossil records are particularly patchy, we could have something that appears to go extinct and then reappears again much later in the ge in, 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 in geological time. And these are termed Lazarus taxa, uh, after some chap in the Bible who supposedly died then came back to life, as illustrated by this realistic cartoon here. Um, and filling in the gaps removes the effects of, of, of Lazarus taxa, uh, because we assume that the most parsimonious answer to this reoccurrence is not that it's gone extinct and re-evolved identically again, but in fact it's just missing from the fossil record due to the patchiness of the record itself. It was actually living there all along. Um, that doesn't help alleviate issues of like the signal ellipse effect when ranges are, are always going to be trun truncated by non-preservation. So species B and C, for example, we can't be completely confident that time period three is, is B's last occurrence and time period five is C's first occurrence. Uh, but we can do things like we can apply confidence intervals to ranges based upon abundances, abundance distributions within ranges. Um, we can also quantify gappiness based on uh, things like the simple completeness metric. So we can take a count of sample taxa divided by range taxa, times that by 100 for any one time interval, and then we get a percentage that will give you the sort of percentage completeness of that particular fossil range. Um, ranging diversity, as I said, also a good way of removing the effects of Lazarus taxa, but we can also fill in the gaps via the implementation um, a phylogeny should be less dependent on fossil record quality uh, than taxon counts because we are inferring relationships between uh, taxa. We're not counting occurrences through time. Um, and then we can use uh, a phylogeny to fill in the gaps by ghost ranges between sister taxa. So consider that B and C are sister taxa. We can then infer that there is a ghost range between the first occurrence of C and the first occurrence of, of, of B where we can put the minimum a splitting age between these two taxa. Um, and using such methods like these, we can also calculate things like phylogenetic diversity estimates as well as taxa diversity estimates, which should be less prone um, to issues surrounding gappiness in the fossil record. So a more tailored method for dealing with bias rather than just incompleteness in the fossil record is, is subsampling. So subsampling is a, is a commonly used practice in ecological studies as well for ironing out temporal and spatial biases in occurrence data. Um, and subsampling removes bias by, by fixing sample size or, or coverage, as you'll see in a little bit, um, to a consistent level across all the time bins or, or geographical localities, for example, that we're interested in. Um, the most well-known method of, of subsampling is, is probably rarefaction. Um, some, it's a technique that many of you will be familiar with, which involves resampling to a fixed sample size. Uh, we then get a consistent level of sampling across all the data points within uh, the time periods that we're interested in. Uh, and this can dramatically alter a paleodiversity curve. So here we have, um, again, a plot from uh, my former PhD student, Fiona Walker's work on, on the, the, the Cretaceous chalk in the south of the UK. So here we have raw generic richness going through time. Um, these are different formations as we go up through the stratigraphical column left to right. Um, raw richness tends to increase about mid halfway through uh, the system and then stays relatively, relatively stable. But if we actually subsample uh, for, for sample to a fixed sample size uh, via rarefaction, we actually see that diversity wasn't particularly as low as we thought during this interval, um, and then it increases earlier actually than we see um, in the raw plot, and then dips a little bit, but then stays at this consistent level. So it does alter 
the perception of, of paleodiversity through time when, when we equalize our, our sample sizes. However, rarefaction has a number of issues. So first of all, you are forced to degrade your data down to the level of the lowest sample size. Obviously, you can omit certain data points, but you're always going to be degrading your best data down to a less desirable level. And this might be okay for investigating patterns of, of say, relative species richness through time, but it's not necessarily a good idea if you're interested in reconstructing, reconstructing community assemblages, for example. Also, rarefaction doesn't deal well when evenness is low. So say there are a few dominant taxa and then lots of rare taxa in your data set. So the red prawn here, for example, is very dominant. This data set has a very low evenness. If you subsample this using rarefaction, the rare taxa will always be underrepresented in the rarefied subsample. So say we subsample this down to a, a, size of, a sample size of 10. We may then all we may get our prawns and mussels because they are the most abundant um, taxa in, in this data set. So the more recently developed method for sort of subsampling gets, gets the better of rarefaction on, on all of these issues. Um, this is shareholder quorum subsampling, or FQS for short, um, and it's become the standard method for bias removal via subsampling in, in paleobiological studies uh, ever since its publication by John Alroy around, in, in around uh, 2010. The FQS subsamples to a fixed level of coverage rather than sample size, and therefore it is better at preserving rare taxa in, in subsampled data sets, uh, and thus, therefore, the pattern of, of representative diversity at lower sampling levels than rarefaction is. And unlike rarefaction, it creates a, that creates an ever flatter diversity curve as you go down to sl smaller sample sizes. Uh, SQS actually preserves that original curve even when you're going down to lower coverage levels. So it's a much more effective method uh, for subsampling uh, whilst attempting to preserve the, the, the diversity signal that you're after. Say by coverage level, um, our means continuing to resample until a predetermined proportion of the abundance distribution has been reached. So we're not stopping at a particular sample size. Um, this proportion is called the, the quota or sometimes the quorum level. Uh, and sampling as a proportion of abundance gives richness estimates that are more comparable um, when, when evenness differs across samples. So in this rather uneven data set, if we, if we uh, subsample to a, a, a set coverage level, we're more likely to preserve at least some of the rare taxa than we would using rarefaction. So SQS can therefore have a dramatic effect on how we read diversity in the fossil record. Uh, by ironing out sampling biases in our data, but it's not going to be too overly conservative uh, as rarefaction may be. So this example from Emma Dunn shows how the application of appropriate bias uh, mitigation methods can really change our perception of, of macroevolutionary and macroecological events. So the application of SQS to Carboniferous, uh, Permian, Tetrapod diversity data here has cast doubt on this previous idea of increasing diversity across this entire interval, as shown in the raw data here, um, which was basically interpreted as um, the effects of the, the uh, Carboniferous rainforest collapse causing um, habitat fragmentation, which drove speciation. So you have the rainforest collapse across here and then this massive increase in speciation rates and, and, and diversity. Um, however, once we apply SQS to this data, or once Emma did, sorry, uh, these new results show an initial decline in diversity, followed by a burst in cosmopolitanism after the early perm in the early Permian after the, the rainforest collapse itself. So we're getting a, a bit of an extinction event across the rainforest collapse, and then um, a, a, an increase in cosmopolitanism um, without any uh, environmental barriers uh, between different habitats. So moving on in terms of methods, the other popular method for removing bias in, in paleodiversity data sets has been uh, sampling proxy or residual modeling, as it's often known. So this was first developed by Andrew Smith and Alistair McGowan, and then further developed by Graham Lloyd. Um, so residual modeling works by, by finding a relationship between uh, sampling and diversity, usually through, well, through a regression analysis, uh, and then basically you plot the residuals to identify times when diversity is lower or higher than expected given the sampling level. So you have your line of best fit of your regression model through the middle here, and then you look at the residuals, which are the differences between this best fit, best fitting line um, and, and the data points itself. Um, and therefore anything above the model line represents diversities higher than expected, given a certain level of sampling, and everything below 
alive is diversity that's, that's lower than expected, uh, given a uh, particular level of sampling. And in theory, it effectively removes bias signal and leaves a true diversity signal. But or more realistically, we say what's, it will give you what's left of a raw diversity signal that cannot be explained um, by the sampling proxy you're using to model it. So this technique has been used extensively in studies of the vertebrate fossil record in particular, where, where subsampling can often be difficult due to very low sample sizes to begin with. So here is an example from Roger Benson and colleagues. Um, so Roger has been another powerful uh, voice in the, in the bias debate over the last 10 years or so. And he's been uh, using the residual mo modeling method quite frequently. Uh, so here we use formation counts to model diversity of mesozoic marine reptiles. So things like um, myosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, turtles, mosasaurs. Um, and the model results give very different um, results to the raw curve. So here we have a taxic. So TDE, taxic diversity estimation, and phylogenetic diversity estimation from the raw fossil record. Here we have our sampling proxy, which is um, marine fossiliferous formation counts. And here's our residual diversity curve. So after we've removed the sampling signal from this taxic diversity estimate, and what we effectively get is there seems to be no major late Triassic mass extinction anymore. We get diversity increase across the TJ boundary. Um, but there does, in its place, or well, not in its place, but Alternatively, there seems to be a major extinction event at the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary that we see a massive drop off um, in, in diversity. Or, if we're going to interpret this model literally, we see a drop in, in diversity that cannot be accounted for by, by sampling. Um, so, here's another example that using the, um, the marine mollusk data um, that I, I took from the paleobiology database earlier. Uh, and we're using freely available code from Graham Lloyd's website. Uh, we can model marine mollusk diversity based upon uh, marine, marine fossiliferous formations throughout the entire Phanerozoic. Um, so what we get as the output is a plot that looks like this. So within the dotted lines of the, of the model in the centre here, this is within error of the model. So anything that crops out within these dotted lines, basically we cannot say hasn't been caused by variations in sampling. And it's only when we get these peaks above and above, below this line where we get a diversity signal that cannot be explained by sampling. So here are diversity dips where diversity is lower than we would expect given uh, given sampling. And then we have a few peaks where diversity is higher than we would expect. And we can identify some events from this. So we have the late Devonian extinction. It may be occurring a little early here. But it's a definite massive dip in diversity. It cannot be explained by sampling. Then we have the Capitanian and late Permian mass extinctions that stand out, the late Triassic mass extinction, and, and the early Jurassic extinction. And also, oxygen, uh, ocean and oxygen event 2 at the Cenomonium Tyronean boundary seems to be looking at as a significant dip in diversity in this plot as well. We also get a rise in Cenozoic diversity, so maybe we're not, in, in bivalves at least, dealing with an artificial rise in, in diversity up to the present day. Um, because of, of, of sampling being better as we get towards the present day, maybe there has, has actually been a, a true increase in diversity through the Cenozoic. One thing we don't see, we don't see an Ordovician mass extinction. I mean, bivalves weren't a massively major part of the Ordovician ocean biota, so that's maybe why. But really interesting, we're not seeing a Cretaceous paleogene extinction. We know bivalves were quite badly hit at this interval, um, but this plot doesn't show any uh, dip at all. And that's one of the weaknesses of this method is that you're relying entirely on your sampling proxy to tell you um, what uh, what is driving sampling. But if um, sampling is low and diversity is also low, it will always interpret that as being a sampling bias. So maybe we are getting very low diversity uh, or an extinction event across the Cretaceous boundary, but because sampling is also low, the model will always assume that it's because of sampling. So it's quite a conservative method careful about how you actually interpret it. Um, so there are a number of, of, of other caveats associated with this approach uh, that also need to be highlighted. So sampling proxies can mean different things, right? So any one sampling proxy doesn't in reality capture all of those things that we saw in Emma Dunn's infographic about bias in the fossil record. Um, no sampling proxy can capture all of those biasing signals. And actually, if we think about it in more detail, some of them are overly simplistic as well. So some of the early work I did during my PhD showed that if we take outcrop area, it doesn't actually correlate with the amount of rock that's actually exposed. 
and most paleontologists will collect from exposed um, exposed outcrops where we don't have to dig away lots of topsoil or drill up a, dig up a road or something to get to our rocks. So maybe outcrop area doesn't represent it, maybe a good representation of the amount of rock that's potentially available to study at great effort, but it's not maybe representative of the amount of rock that has been studied. Um, we also need to consider uh, Shannon Peters' common cause ideas uh, that state that environmental drivers have been driving both sampling opportunity and diversity simultaneously, uh, rather than sampling driving diversity. So, for example, take sea level change on over, over geological timescales. So a big transgression may create more uh, shelf area, flooded shelf area. Um, therefore, there's more habitable space for organisms uh, to diversify and occupy, but also more accommodation space for, for sediments. Um, therefore, more shallow marine rock is preserved because of the greater accommodation space for, for, for sedimentation. Um, and also higher marine diversity because of greater accommodation space for, for organisms and diversification to occur. And then sea level fall brings the exact opposite. You get less shelf area, so less accommodation space for biodiversity and sedimentation. So what we're seeing is a, is, is a co-varying of, of the rock and fossil records, but all being driven by environmental processes. Um, however, one drawback of this hypothesis is that there's no mechanism for a terrestrial common cause idea along the same lines. Um, another serious consideration when selecting a sampling proxy for residual modelling purposes is, is information redundancy. So we must um, be really careful that the two variables that are correlating closely, like the sampling proxy and the diversity signal, uh, we, we must be really careful that they are they're independent of one another. And not if they're non-independent, they may be effectively driving each other. So whilst it's hard to imagine how diversity can drive outcrop area, it's, it's plausible that diversity could drive, at least in part, the description and naming of geological formations. Um, a lot of temporal uh, geological units are defined on fossil first occurrences, last occurrences, exam for example. So even though formations should be defined on lit lithostratigraphic uh, content, I think it's fairly um, acceptable to assume that, that fossil content may also have a part in, in the de definition of formations. So some work that I carried out with Beata Hannestal applying information theory techniques uh, to these time series has showed it suggests exactly that and what we see is that actually formation counts predict um, bio, uh, diversity uh, but only as well as, as diversity also predicts formation counts um, and this becomes even worse when we are using um, clade specific formation counts so if we're, if we're using uh, brachiopod bearing formations as a sampling proxy for brachiopod diversity um, this information redundancy is, is, is very, very high. And actually, once if we use simulated fossil records and, and apply these corrections using residual modelling, uh, when we're using clade-specific spe formation counts, we're actually making the signal worse by applying this correction. So the, the actual corrected fossil record in this instance is less accurate than the raw fossil record. So we need to be really careful that we're not actually making the problem worse by using some of these corrections. So... That's just a brief summary of some of the methods that we can use, and I'm going to move on to just reflecting back on everything that we've covered and, and answer some of the big questions about the quality of the fossil record that we um, that we set out at the beginning. So the fossil record is incomplete. Yes, it is. We know it is, as highlighted by this graphic here. We probably know about 10%, what we potentially could know about 10% of life that's ever existed. Obviously, that's just a figure that's been largely plucked out of thin air, but it's quite a a low number and I think it should give us uh, some cause for concern. But also on top of that the fossil record is biased so the incompleteness isn't consistent through time and there's all of these factors that can introduce bias into data uh, from the fossil record. But is the fossil record adequate? I'd say maybe. For example we see a great deal of a stratigraphic and phylogenetic congruence where fossils occur in um, in the rocks roughly in the order we expect them to. You don't see dinosaurs in the Cambrian, you don't see trilobites um, up in, in the Cenozoic, and that fits with, with phylogeny, which is largely independent um, of, 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 to the patchiness of the fossil record. Um, but I think the issue of the adequacy of the fossil record ultimately hinges on, on, on what sort of question uh, you're actually wanting to ask. So if you want to extract diversity patterns for a particular clade, stage by stage, so if you want all of these little 
wiggle through time. Um, it's a massive challenge. It's maybe even impossible, right? And the model shows this in the fact that once we try and correct sampling, a lot of the a lot of the <coughs> evolutionary history of bivalves, marine bivalves here is actually within the bounds of error in the model. So we actually can't say much about the true diversity signal. But if you want to identify some periods of drastic change, like mass extinction events, they are there in both the corrected and uh, the uncorrected data. So we can access certain patterns from even from the raw fossil record. So therefore, the raw fossil record is adequate for studying uh, mass extinction dynamics. You may get some bias overprinting, but these events are so large that we do actually see them shining through. And even when we apply our most conservative correction methods to fossil data, we see many of these mass extinction events still standing out very prominently. Um, oh, there they are. So again, attempts to reconstruct Paleozoic paleodiversity using different methods have produced very different results. And I think it's important to consider them all when we're going to make our interpretations. So it's still with the jury, really, as to which of these models is most effects, most effectively reflects the history of life on Earth. But I would say they're both really important in identifying these, these key macroevolutionary events that, we, that we're so interested in studying. Um, it's also important to remember that adequacy and completeness are very different concepts. And whilst the fossil record may be incomplete and biased, it may still be adequate for most requirements of paleontology and macroevolution, uh, given the use of the appropriate methodologies as well. So to finish, uh, I'm going to finish with a protocol of best practice as devised by me. So follow it at your peril, I guess I should say. Um, so start off by identifying your question. So be clear on what you're asking from the fossil record. Uh, and don't just throw lots of methods at a diversity curve and, and see what happens, basically. Um, think about the bias that was within your data. So um, and think about whether your data you have is, is adequate for answering that question and how to mitigate the bias maybe maybe different uh, depending on the questions that you're answering so plot your raw data um, it's often easy to identify anomalies qualitatively just by looking at a diversity curve for example uh, and it's important to identify what you're dealing with before pressing on with any with any uh, mitigation methods so think about it again keep thinking about the bias so try and quantify it use a suitable metric to quantify the bias maybe Use sampling proxies to give you an idea of what sort of bias may be impacting your data. Subsampling is, is best for a diversity curve if you could do it. Uh, so subsampling if necessary, if possible. Uh, again, an SQS method is, is proven to be better than, 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 um, uh, than rarefaction. But obviously, depending on the fossil record you're working with, it may not be possible or may not be appropriate to subsample. If some sub, 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 if sample, existing initial sub, uh, sample sizes are inappropriate for subsampling, maybe if you're working with fossils like dinosaurs, um, I would suggest working on brachiopods instead, maybe, or, or try something like the residual modelling. But, but, but beware of all of the caveats. Don't overinterpret this data. Um, select your sampling proxy carefully. Beware of things like redundancy and common cause, uh, and try not to obliterate the tiny bit of biological signal that you have. In, in say the vertebrate fossil record by being over conservative in your application of a sampling proxy. And I think it's really important, I think it's probably been lost in some of the bias literature, um, not to immediately discount your raw data. Now, corrected data can be wrong too, a lot of these are models, and there's an old saying that says all models are wrong. Um, but obviously, I think we can use these methods to our advantage and we can compare patterns across all of our different. Um, uh, different data sources so compare the raw data with the corrected data and don't automatically discount it and so i'm going to leave this there so thanks for listening um and thanks for uh well it's been 45 minutes so yeah thanks for sticking around and listening to it all i shan't be listening back to it uh, but hopefully other people will i'd just like to give some acknowledgements um so to all of my students and collaborators in the large circles who uh, worked on studies associated with this topic with me and you're all wonderful scientists and people. Uh, and, and to those in, in the smaller circles here who have inspired and challenged my work on the subject matter, um, you are or, or were, um, also uh, fantastic and wonderful scientists. Uh, thanks to many of uh, my many hosts and funders um, throughout the last 10 years who've supported this work. Um, and finally, thanks to everyone at the 
the Paleontological Virtual Congress uh, for organising this event, and, and a special thanks to Amelia and Chris uh, for kindly inviting me to give this uh, keynote presentation. And I hope that at least some of the people um, have and, and will find this uh, this uh, presentation uh, useful. Uh, thanks very much.